the way I see it, you know, some people rely on the video, but um, yeah, two weeks ago, the video didn't, didn't record. All right, what, what happened now? This be on, yay, it switched, even better. All right. Session. That means we are in official exam, finals week, final assignment stress. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at additional thoughts on housing. Um, we talk about is our um, performer socially inclusive enough, and with the housing discussion, and particularly the physical form of housing, through the textbook and the class and the questions rising. Um, I want to explore a little bit the outside world with some pictures, uh, actually examples from my last trip to Germany in summer, and then put this under the idea of urban renewal. Urban renewal is like a revitalization, rehabbing of what is there currently in the system. Uh, urban renewal in a very abstract thing is you could say if you have a fish tank you replace most of the water and add two additional fish and see how that experiment will work. Something wrong? The slide. All right. Um, so we're doing this with some applied pictures, a little bit of the story behind that. We had also the uh, example of the courtyard, uh, like the donut building, uh, last week. So I have a few slides for this as well, just to give you an idea of how uh, what I would consider hidden market spaces. Um, it's an idea. It's, the, it's a historical building in the picture, but the idea is also if you design new things. How can you be inspired with that? Yeah? And how can we transfer that? All right. um, then, following our syllabus, we're having a short discussion on uh, what's going on with water utilities, utilities layout, etc. Et Your guys are late. Work on the group project, man. Sorry. Thank you. Five people late. I hope the group is doing fine. I'm looking forward to the group. We actually just said it's the best group we've been in in the program because everybody does their part, and it's very... Well, we will we'll talk, we'll talk about it. Yeah. So, um, any additional thoughts on housing? None? All right, so the, the idea now is to answer it, actually the question, okay, what kind of, what is urban renewal? Yeah. Some people would argue it is somewhat a infill development. Some people say it's rehabilitation. Um, if you look at places like Vinwood, rehab came through personal private investment and the arts. Uh, there's a certain voice in the planning community and among developers arguing that the redevelopment through the arts is a very interesting way to do because it creates vibrant places. I mean, no, places are spaces with felt value, identity, and culture. Um, there's little to report on the economic side, how arts impacts uh, a community. The most known impact is land prices are going up, and you will certainly see that maybe the population is changing. We call it somewhat gentrification. Yeah? But are there other additional benefits you can actually present? Yeah. That's one of the larger questions when we talk about urban renewal. Um, for us as real estate development, the question here is, uh, what does this mean? Do, can I do urban renewal in the size of eight different blocks in the downtown Miami? Probably not, because the scale and the impact is too much. Can you do urban renewal on half a block? Can you do it as infill development in smaller communities? Sure, you can. Uh, I have a little bit of video, which is now perfect timing for people who have decided to eat. Sorry. That's okay. I have no, the morning platform and have a lot of time in between. I don't know yet since he was just about 10 weeks old. The breeder that I got him from had him on medical. Now you don't have to food. Heavily visual oh. on something you don't see. And 
it's worldwide, so it's interesting to see what's going on. physical structure change. I heard wow with the Starbucks and other buildings, or the one wow was where they actually completely eradicated three larger blocks. The important thing here to remember is urban renew renewal or rehab in this case, most of the buildings you have seen, let's say black and white and then new colors, are of some historical value. Uh, so there, there was some historical renovation going on. Some of the examples are complete rebuilds of a whole block. And you also have to remember that this is about time and pace. And does the re development fit the physical structure? The next video, we had Philadelphia last week as an example. Actually, a place about Philadelphia. The next video shows you how disruptive or positive physical structural change can be for society. In terms of the renewal, what I guess would be the most well-known urban renewal out there? In the world? Yeah. Or just something prominent? Something, I mean, I know Harlem had a huge urban renewal, but there's got to be something. So it depends on scale, man. Um, okay, I'm, a, I'm leaning out of the window with this quote sometimes about saying, uh, war is the most brutal urban redevelopment machine in mankind. Yeah? And I'm going to bring you an example of, let's say, larger cities in uh, Germany, Düsseldorf, Berlin, or Munich, particularly Berlin. If you look at historic photos of Berlin, that was flat, bombed out, burned down. Yeah? Through World War II. And then over the past 50, 80 years, there was this redevelopment going on. Yeah? And so I don't know if you can say, hey, Berlin is actually an example if you argue that your development time frame is about 80 years, mm -hmm. 75. Yeah? Um, rehab urban renewal within a dec decade or smaller as in that size of cities? Wow, don't know. What will be interesting to see how the Middle East is rehabbing, mm -hmm. if you think of global scale, um, cities like Aleppo, uh, back that, back, back, yeah. Aleppo is critical right now because it's, um, I would think, completely gone. The way you mm -hmm. see pictures and it's reported, um, and the population is gone too. So it will be interesting to see. It will be interesting to see in the next decade if that's that fast. Well, Lebanon How is gorgeous, or was, was bombed, and then it's gorgeous again. Yeah. So we'll. we'll 
got to see. Um, again, rehab can be done on two, two parcels as infill, and you create. We have seen those pictures, you know, those beautiful small homes in between. Uh, one of the last example was the rehab of that two floor high uh, building with a detail on the bottom and apparently office floor um, residential in the top. That is, I think, the most common elements you can see. I was, uh, over Thanksgiving, I was in Cincinnati. Over the Rhine as a neighborhood, is there? 10, 15 years ago, it was the most dangerous city or neighborhood, neighborhood in that area. Now, it's the central hub for good food, good beers, brewery redevelopment, uh, housing, some design issues with housing projects here and there, but uh, that really it's like booming, like in small new town in mini suburbia. Yeah? It's now the brand label is over the Rhine, it's associated not anymore with street rides and shooting and, and, and crime, it's associated with this is a cool place to live. Yeah? So, <coughs> different vibes on this one. <coughs> what I want to show you, that's the reason why um, I have the three little videos here, what I want to show you is um, how Selected acclaimed modern architect I.M. Pei to 
designed the centerpiece of the renewal, Society Hill Towers, which broke ground in 1963. Mayor Richardson Hill built a home for his family on nearby Washington Square. And Bacon designed a network of wheelways with the pedestrian pathway between the streets. The old Philadelphia Development Corporation marketed the idea of living in a restored colonial village to families that uh, had ancestry that dated back to the colonial period. The first couple of buyers we had were Jared Ingersoll and his wife, uh, who was a very famous Philadelphia, and Henry Watts, who was the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. I bought a house on 3rd Street. People who were young, like my husband and myself, we moved in because we could do a lot of the houses ourselves and we built those houses, we rebuilt them. It was like a Vermont village. Everybody got together, everybody knew everybody. And then as it got more and more built up, it became more stratified. South Street and Lumber Street, when I was real little, they were black neighborhoods. By the time I got to be a teenager, there was the, the first gentrification wave was Society Hill. The blacks who lived on Lumber Street were, were gone. Then they moved over to South Street, a kind of erasure. City policy approach did not consult with the very people that were being removed from their homes. Everyday people feeling like they didn't have control or say over their lives, over where they lived, where they could send their kids to school. Many are the sins of urban renewal, but society became the model all around the country for how to revive city neighborhoods, not through demolition, but through preservation. In the space of two decades, Society Hill became one of Philadelphia's wealthiest neighborhoods. At the same time, Bacon's planning office guided urban renewal efforts throughout the city, creating Penn Center, Independence Mall, and Eastwood, projects that would transform <coughs> Philadelphia's identity. All right. Different type of urban renewal, huh? <coughs> So the first one was showing you just by pictures old made new or old completely new built. Yeah? This, even if it's a little bit different historic span and very short information about Society Hill in Philadelphia, you get the vibration here that a top-down approach from, hey, I have a great idea, let's rebuild this neighborhood, is not working out for the people living in those neighborhoods. Yeah? Something we all kind of know, heard, but maybe have not seen yet before. Huh? So that's part of the idea of, hey, when you're going to new cities, you got to check out what's going on. Don't be the typical tourist. Take a look at the second or third floor when you walk down the street. Huh? No one is about to make this sign again, but absorb cities in a different way but after this class. Look at sites in a different way after this class. Yeah? Um, because if you are able to look at things in a different way, and you learn every time you have a field trip, every time you're on vacation, granted, cruise ship might not be the best place to learn that, yeah? but that's experience you bring back into your daily life and work. Yeah? The next one, is an example where urban renewal is in a different approach and it's more a marketing tool of, hey, we are going to be so great. Huh? It's almost like a political campaign. I'm going to be awesome with this. Huh? Australia's great global city, with its breathtaking natural beauty and an unparalleled harbour waterfront. Yet only two kilometres from Sydney's CBD, there's a unique opportunity for an exciting and visionary urban renewal. Urban
Urban Growth New South Wales will lead this transformational revitalisation, comprising Blackwater Bay, home to the Sydney fish markets, Rosal Bay and Rail Yards, and the White Bay Power Station. The bays will be an iconic distance. scale done in the US? East Coast? Chelsea Piers. No, I mean the whole, the whole marina, the whole harbour area completely remodeled. Baltimore? And Baltimore. Baltimore. West. Baltimore. So uh, they're promoting here is basically what Baltimore has done with the harbour area. Yeah. So think about that kind of scale. Like, <coughs> extremely large and expensive. The base will be an iconic destination that beckons the world. The White Bay Power Station is one of the city's most remarkable heritage buildings due to its raw industrial spaces and its role as an important landmark. The White Bay Power Station is in need of significant revitalization and will act as a catalyst for urban renewal. and revitalise Sydney for all Australians. So different, yeah? Uh, you have seen those three videos, different pace, different money volume, you have seen it had uh, that urban renewal was criticized uh, with the negative impacts on society. And then the last video actually turned it around and said, this has got to be so great. Yeah? But there's a difference. In the case of Sydney, at least the way they presented it, is there are not many people living there compared to what Philadelphia could do. Yeah? So it brings us to the question, urban renewal, was it, what is it for R&D? Yeah. Is that something we should touch? Something that's profitable for us? Something that makes sense for communities? Yeah. Technically, it's a redevelopment. Yeah. Technically, it's a real estate product. The larger question here is, it's not as easy as a green fill development on fresh land. Many rules if you look at historic preservation. Uh, how how do you follow those rules? Uh, well, so pro and cons of urban renewal. Do you have any more? <coughs> ben, any idea? What's what's really good about urban renewal? <coughs> um, you get to keep some of the culture, uh, the identity of, of the city in the case of Philadelphia. They have a lot of history that they just didn't want to tear down, so you uh -huh. have to maintain you know, something that's made your city space, you know, special. So, uh, I think that's a pro. All right. Like the stairs, the bell. <clears throat> well, they were talking about in Sydney using that old power plant and keeping it, you know, right. to kind of symbolize. So instead of tearing it down and building something nicer, they, they, they've made a conscious effort to, to keep that structure and make it a focal point. So the rust belt and uh, um, steel industry area of <coughs> Germany, uh, the Rhine Valley, uh, and not, not, not Rhine Westphalia um, is famous for their exhibit space now because you have now the old gas works is actually an exhibit. Uh, the old, uh, um, what do you call those, mining towers where you have the elevator shafts and all yeah. that. 
they got rehabbed and put some lighting on it. It's one of the most green areas by green space uh, in Germany. So Iba Emscher Park, International uh, Building Association or Exhibit, um, or something. Yeah, I think this is what the example in, in, for Sydney will show as well. They are maintaining historical preserved buildings and then add new substance to it. Yeah. We'll see how this works out. All right. So, told you a little bit of stories about um, going to be a little bit more visual. That's the city of Bayreuth, Germany, known for the Wagner Music Festival. And yes, yeah, sometimes it fits too. Mm -hmm. And um, what you look at right now is actually a former channelized creek coming in, in uh, into the city, being channeled in tunnels and pipes. And then they realized one day this was cut, uh, closed with concrete blocks. And one day they realized that actually the concrete ceiling here was falling apart. Like, the story goes that the lady was walking her dog, and she, she and her dog basically halfway dropped into that hole. You know? What they did, and this is my example for urban rehab, those are multiple hundreds of years old buildings. Gray or yellow sandstone, believe it or not, that's actually yellow sandstone, but aged. Yeah, that's the opera house is right next, not the Wagner, the other opera house, and this is a bank. And what they actually did is they dig out the whole thing, created a semi something, a uh, pedestrian area here, and people are using now these stairs as recreational space. Yeah. If you, if you study in the uh, city of Bayreuth, what you end up probably with a, a small picnic basket and bottle of red wine in the evening sitting, hanging out there. Now that's almost waterfront development now. Yes? Why is it, uh, I guess, consumer preference wise, you're talking about the old buildings that made me think about, for example, if you go up to the Hamptons, you know, people want these old homes, they want historic. Yeah, but they're we have so, so they're by code and, uh, and energy conserving. Right, yeah. but down here the mentality is tear it down and build something new, where up north it's more grab something that's old. And, I, I mean, but I just again, it depends on the region and the culture and the social. Yeah. And it also depends on the building uh, structures. And so for context, too, I mean, yeah. you're not going to take an old house in the middle of a bunch of spec homes and rehab it as an old house. So the people that are looking to buy those places, but if you go to like places like Coral Gables or, or, or Miami Shores, you'll notice that the style of architecture in the houses, people aren't carrying houses on and building new stuff. Yeah. So you you try to mimic what's the what's in the culture, but you're going to urban design already. Yeah? That's important. What they did here is you said instead of flat concrete or again black top street, let's create this and make this more a vibrant space. Yeah, they actually created a place with this because people now recreate there. Everything being here is coffee shops. Yeah? So the one thing what you, you do in in uh, Germany is you walk a lot and drink a lot of coffee. Uh, and drink and a beer. lot of coffee and beer. So this is the back street. On, on street parking. This is a bicycle in case you have it don't know. Yeah, off street, <laughs> on, on street, on street parking here as well, pedestrian zones here, lots of green, old homes, is actually old houses with a new one right next to it, but this is all in one block, basically walk around, uh, walking space. Look at the different patterns. And this is texture, a texture so uh, material. This is a rehab. This is the only concrete building, I would think, in the whole area here. This is actually an old church, active, still active church. Yeah? And this is on a Tuesday morning um, with very cold, bad weather in July. This is the other way, like literally, this is turning left, this is turning right. And you can see this is, did I screw this up? This is wide enough that you can actually deliver. Yeah? in the morning, so all these vans and trucks are actually supposed to be gone by 10.30. Uh, they open up water here as a water play, there is actually a water play here for kids. This is one of those big screws, you can twist the water up. What we use in third world development to pump water up, kids play with this. 
Yeah, and then welcome to Bavaria. This is actually the uh, outdoor seating of a restaurant, and I think, yeah, I took it out. I took out that stereotype beer picture. Everything central, central Germany? Northern Bavaria, north of Nuremberg. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here. Somewhere. If you look at the map of Frankfurt, it's perfectly east of Frankfurt. Yeah, okay. Perfectly east, three hours, four hours drive down. Um, what I like is on the, these short pictures here is I reflect 25 years of change in here. Yeah. So the first mm -hmm. change was the channeling. Then they had this was open for the regular traffic years, decades ago. Then they closed it down for only transit. So you would sit here and there would be a bus moving by because the original bus stop was right next to the corner. Now they moved the transit stop and opened up the whole place here. This was the bus stop. So <coughs> at, let's say at the top of the hour you would have 10 buses sitting there and idling. Now, not really cool just to walk, to walk by and do your shopping thing. You know? So they recreated this and changed this through massive intervention. Story goes, um, McDonald's used to be here. Is this one? Or, yeah. Story goes in the 1780s, a US tank would park in the middle of the street and the GIs would actually go to, burger, uh, to uh, McDonald's and got their cheeseburgers. Because the largest um, training area outside of the United States is actually within the hour drive time. So this has changed from heavy traffic to pure pedestrian and biking. Now you're endangered actually now being run over by a bicyclist. So quick, <coughs> quick idea, and this is why I try to present those pictures, is it all depends on transportation and how we perceive this kind of systems of flow. Yeah? And our systems of flow linkages. Yeah? So this comes back to how we create sites, how do we create, transform spaces into places. Yeah? We also need to understand, okay, what kind of transport and what kind of movement of goods you have. Yeah? I remember, the book has more the philosoph philosophy chapters in the beginning, now they're talking a little bit more technical. Yeah? So there's uh, some repetition in this. So again, Trend, planning for transportation, well, it depends. In your last assignment, you saw you needed to align building and parking. And most of you actually put streets into that concept you know, to make sure that buildings are accessible. And everyone had a different flavor on how to do those um, route, the kind of routing and the uh, movement of uh, parking spaces and movement of cars. Yeah. I think no one really noted pedestrian. You had a very interesting design in terms of roundabouts on it. But um, so everyone was pretty much automobile focused. Uh, I had pedestrian. <coughs> I had pavers, not as ah, yeah. and I had around uh, circular area to slow down. Did I offend you again? If you're no. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure. Uh, I tried to uh, provide like an uh, equidistant relationship between each of the buildings. I had apartments uh, on the north corner, uh, ground floor retail and restaurants. And yeah, you had a hotel, I think. <coughs> and a hotel, so I provide like a distance for each uh, user for the space. So, in a perfect world, transportation is also a channel for infrastructure and utilities. Yeah? So, in a perfect world, we have no aging infrastructure. What's the average rating of infrastructure in the US right now? A day. That's very optimistic. Yeah? Um, the idea here, and I think I have it on the next few slides, is if you put it on the crown, you will forget about it. Yeah? The reason why utilities are in your mind most of the time is because you see the overhead wiring in your community. That's disappearing now because in terms of design and the appeal and aesthetics, folks are putting wires now on the ground. Electrical systems, cable systems, 
you know, uh, internet, class fiber, uh, fiber class, I'm sorry, uh, all that will disappear. Water and sewer, traditionally, you know, <laughs> underground, you know? Famous story, we did scanning uh, for water and sewer maps in Wilmington, Delaware, and they actually had to get folks out of retirement to verify what was on the plants and why and where are the, um, the pipes, because they actually used wooden pipes. Yeah? Infrastructure, that all that the main of the pipe things, the piping system was actually wood. That's not thinking about your current assets you have in the, in the ground. I feel like you should put the cash in there. It's not a cask, it's a pipe. Yeah. Huh? So, what we need to consider when we do development, and the good planning department will ask you these questions. Yeah? Operating costs, maintenance. That's the difference between a development with a private road versus a development where you hand over that road to the local municipality. I think I gave that example. The most bizarre example is what you can deal with is snow removal. Yeah? Um, so who's in charge of that? If it's a private road, who is going to be in charge of all the utilities and the services provided? Yeah? Got to think about that. So, fun question then is, how should planners make decisions when there are no external costs of driving? This goes back into the idea of what are the costs of transportation? In commercial transportation, you see the trucks, air, and rail, ship. Huh? What are the costs here when we say, okay, fine, every action we take has a consequence? Huh? So if you look at the cars and how the cars got developed, catalytic converters, and now we have hybrids. And the last thing commercial I saw was a electric hybrid. Yeah. So it goes down to cover of the paper today. Yeah. Which is the electric hybrid even more yeah. uh, going going more and more combinations of such. Yeah. Basically the argument here was <coughs> these are costs. <coughs> Your development is imposing on society. The example is easy. If you put a Industrial side up, chemical production, you know, and you keep, let's say you do herbicides and pesticides. It's somewhat expected that this is not going to be a healthy place. Your neighborhood with tons of car traffic, etc., is not a healthy place either. If you have to drive everywhere to get everything, that's not healthy. I had a friend who moved years ago from uh, this region here up into the mountains reduced commuting time of 40 minutes to an hour from plantation to Boca Raton down to 50, 10, 50, 10 minutes on the bike. In his first year in the job he dropped 30 pounds. Now, change of tra uh, commu uh, the daily commute, not sitting in the car, different type of food and all that more than an hour extra time for family or fun stuff. We talked about, and I think the market analysis class is doing this as well as an assignment, we talked about your daily commute. You know? Where do you live? Where do you go to school? Where do you work? And how do you reduce those linkages and optimize that? That's a significant decision. The real estate market actually does reflect that because certain areas are more vibrant in the price because you're close by. If you look for an apartment or for a house, walk score gives you that impression. You know? The higher the walk score, you probably have to deal with a little bit more in the pricing. You know? so, but you also have different costs involved. You know? This does not include right now actually the gasoline costs of driving. We can skip this. <coughs> Fundamental, because that benefits you can count that not just for transportation. Fundamental idea between uh, behind net benefits is you have to have a purpose for that destination for that trip, and you should not spend all the time traveling versus the time at that destination. 
It doesn't make sense if you go shopping for 15 minutes for daily groceries to drive two hours. Now, and do that trip every day because we want every day a fresh egg. Now, this is misconceptualization of your time and the cost involved. Now, you might drive four hours one way for a two hour funeral and then drive four hours back. Now, but the trip purpose is different. Now, so, the question in here is what you gain out of this and what kind of gains do you have? Let's say you drop off the kiddos at the kindergarten or in school. Well, that's a trip you must do. What's the gain of it? Long term, they actually have a benefit in education. You actually have a kid free day and can do work or something. Yeah. But on the other side, you can also say, hey, there have been times where they would have walked or biked or took the school, uh, school bus. So do you need to drop off your kid every morning and pick her or him up in the uh, uh, evening? That's a dip in the interesting thought in terms of cost. Are we planning for this here and there? As a real estate developer, do you price it in? No. Do we do that, consider that? No. <coughs> so I can skip this. Bring me back to um, costs and waiting costs and scheduled delay costs. Yeah? Well, the reason why I present this really weird topic about congestion and costs involved is you are responsible, responsible to guide the flow on your property, on your projects. This is part of your plan. The way you connect to the outside world impacts traffic. You know? If you go to the mall, it's really great, but if you have to stay on the parking lot for 10, 15, 20 minutes to get out, you know, it's not so great. One of the most essential things here in, in the South Florida region is, well, it's a 20 minute commute if traffic is white. Or it's an hour if you're in rush hour. Yeah. There are folks deliberately saying, oh, at this time of the day, don't even think about to go down to Miami. Because you will never make it before sunset. So your lunch is definitely turning to dinner. Yeah. And I'm stereotyping here a little bit. I was lucky I haven't been stuck for hours yet in traffic. but. I heard those horror stories, and I'm like, waiting cost and scheduled delay cost. Thank God for audiobooks if you do something right while you're waiting in your car. Because you can drive and listen to the audiobook. Or actually, you stop, wait, and listen to the audiobook. Yeah. Um, <coughs> are traffic congestion induced costs and relevant for us in RED? I think so. If you look at uh, developments, the residential developments, part, partially the gated communities around rush hour and they are backing up into the street 20 cars long because they have like step by step at the gate, you got to wait to go in. Um, that is an impact on traffic and society. There was a different layout, a different traffic flow on your uh, gated community would be a, a change for this. Yeah? Also, this is me as a from the planning world. Yeah. If we design, this works for site plan, this works for the whole region. If you design traffic, you are creating dependencies on services. Yeah. If you have zero car traffic on your de development, the assumption that there is no um, a trucking company that has to pick up a broken a broken car is pretty okay. I'm not going to involve more details on that, but the idea is okay. Consider what was that? I remember. Consider traffic on your site. That's how it starts. Consider how your site is impacting traffic. Starts with residential homes. I think the, the top of the iceberg then, or the, 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 the other the bottom part of the iceberg, is if you, do, if you do retail. Because you have customers coming in now. Yeah. It adds a good traffic flow concept for pedestrians and cars. And pedestrians can be as easy as and you park here and you walk safe and really refreshing to the facility. 
and you're not really worried about being run over by 50 cars. Right? If you add that to uh, your site design, you, or you're cautious for that, you will add more value to the percep perception of that space. And we know perception of space is very important. Yeah? Gives you that kind of community feel of the parking lot is different. Parking lot completely black top versus parking lot with pedestrian area with some shade trees, a different perception. Yeah? Not doing this. Just a visual again here in terms of um, sprawling neighborhoods. This is a dead end street. This is a circle. So if you live here, this is a driveway. Pretty much. Yeah? Like all these guys are sharing basically some basketball hoops. And um, very, very weird outline. Yeah? We also can see those are different homes. Almost cook, yeah, cookie cutter style homes. I think it was Cincinnati area. Um, and this is the other extreme in terms of old farming, redevelopment, coast or lake, and then new faces coming in, but they still have this kind of flair. Still the same type of homes rotated in the layer. You know, bad, biggest bang for the buck. The question in here again is this is suburbia, this is great to live in. Um, what we do in downtown Fort Lauderdale is we put a big condo in. Yeah? But the traffic costs associated with that condo tower compared to that or that is different. Yeah? I would argue that a home like this will make give you a good condo in our region. Yeah? A little bit more uh, when you talk about sprawl. You know, on the land price uh, gradients, this is part again of the real estate component. It's not a new thing. Yeah? We developed this country on sprawl and expansion. Urban renewal now gives you the idea of how to change that thought. Yeah? Can you reduce certain costs that you impose on your customer and consumer? Can you take them away and use that actually? in urban redevelopment, site redevelopment. Yeah. And let's take a break. Three minutes. They say 18, I'm here, 1821. So if you let's say just like, take a look at um, US cities and the capitals and when they have the capital cities being announced or founded, when you look at that. Stream. That's very interesting to see. Right. What do you got for me? I just realized that I meant to say this. 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 <coughs> hey guys, stand up. Get some fresh air. How are you yeah, doing? Yeah. You're yeah. Not, this is tripping on uh, eye drops all morning. Oh, I'll have a place if you know. Alright, don't rub your eyes. Mm -hmm. Late six, seven years ago, best thing ever. Mm -hmm. Ever. That's what uh, Noah said. I had like negative four, negative oh, four and a half. Huh? It's negative seven. Yeah. <laughs> but now it's like, I had to take them out. Man. I'm warm. It sucks. Yeah. I can see. What? You have good eyes? No problems? Uh, there was a time I actually had classes, and then from one day to the other day, I stopped wearing them. And I have no problems right now. It's called age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm overdue. I'm overdue. Yeah. But it's called age. And I also keep saying I eat a lot of carrots, <laughs> and carrots are good for your eyes. That's what they say. Yeah. And every, and Ben, you know how you tell a story. You tell a six-year-old that she needs to eat her carrots. And why? Yeah. Well, carrots is good for your eyes. 
Uh, why? I don't believe that. Well, have you seen rabbits with classes? <laughs> and then those cows are gone. So yes, this says actually plan us, yeah. Um, I think sprawl and the inefficient use of land is going to be the number one issue for us as developers. Because if you develop larger scale product, like hundreds of housing units in one subdivision, or let's say a small uh, retail mall, linkages and flow of your good people and the goods becomes more important. Yes, you need to balance traffic, you need to balance uh, parking and retail space, or volume of retail space if you have multiple floors. Therefore, you need to deal with that resource, uh, and it's an optimization process. But it also ha has to be a, a thoughtful process on what are your values and what is important for you. Keep that in mind, you're creating spaces. Actually, you create, you're transforming spaces into places with thoughtful development. Yeah? You also then consider the relationship between the destination and origin. Yeah? Big thing is combined trips. Can you do multiple things at the same time when you use your car or your bike? Yeah? Going to Costco on your bicycle might not work if you're more than half a mile away. And you can't buy big boxes on your bicycle. Uh, you're even limited on a small car if you do big shopping. Uh, you can't go to IKEA and buy new bookshelves if you drive a small car like a smart. You won't load six or seven feet long in furniture. Uh, so the idea here, considering the patterns of transit trips, works for your traffic as well, for your individualized traffic. Uh, if you do development right, you should consider transit-oriented development. How do you integrate a bus stop? I'm telling you, if you walk into a uh, planning and zoning uh, department and you say, hey, I have those 20 acres out there, I want to redevelop this with some retail and some apartments, etc. 
one of the fundamental questions I have is, will you give me a transit stop? If you come in for that discussion before you even present your site plan, they will love you. Assuming that there is transit in that area. And it's some of the goals they really want to see. Yeah. Um, when we had the first session, second session, first session, we had uh, alumni speakers for lunch. Remember there was a question about how you guys are planning to build around the uh, rail lines and the rail stations? That was a big plus for them. <coughs> so, traffic, how does it impact? Yeah. When traffic flow is heavy, the critical limit capacity, captivity is the intersection. Again, you create bottlenecks if you do not create good flow and size of your traffic on the site. And I can't stress that out. Really great development fails in its perception when there is no good traffic or parking. You, know, you can develop the most beautiful apartment building, but you still put the regular plaque top, no green, no safe walking spaces uh, on the parking areas. Nobody's they're going to accept that, but it's not going to be the part of what you really want to do. You know? How does a community improve walkability? This is Urban Planning 101. Walkability affects community health, economics, and the overall livability of the town. It's not just about being physically able to walk somewhere, but about all the things that influence your choice to take care of daily activities on foot. 400 meters, or a quarter mile, is the distance the average person can walk in five minutes. When a trip becomes longer, people choose other, more convenient ways of getting around. But we cannot just judge walkability with a straight line measurement. Separated land uses, dead-end streets, large blocks, and poorly designed and arranged developments can mean that many places are undesirable or unsafe to walk through, or more than five minutes away. By changing some of the ways we build our neighborhoods and towns, we can make them more walkable. The following are three ways of doing just that. One, arrange the uses in your community so that people can get to many of them on foot. Put neighborhood convenience stores, daycares, and parks in the heart of residential areas, and make sure these are connected to main downtown commercial districts. And don't make walks too large, or at least include safe, well-designed shortcuts through them. Two, focus on place making. That means making destinations people oriented and interesting by mixing a variety of uses and designing spaces for different kinds and ages of people. And remember, all trips start and end as walking trips, so even include safe walkways through parking lots. And three, make your neighborhoods and districts pleasant for people to walk through with streets, buildings, and landscaping that are all designed to focus on people's experiences. This doesn't have to be complicated. Placing buildings close to the street, avoiding blank walls, and including street trees along sidewalks are some of the most universally effective ways to make a community more pedestrian friendly. With these simple long-term policy goals and land use decisions, and basic design and development solutions, you and your elected officials, municipal planners, and builders work together to improve your community's walkability. I'm Robert Voigt, and this has been Urban Planning 101. What? Oh, okay. uh, he had something in his hand that looked kind of funny. Oh yeah, I'm going to go back and check it out. I'll check it out later. Um, like yeah, I'm not going to say that. that. <laughs> be a big point. So, in terms of walking, there was this interesting notion about every trip starts with walking. You leave your house, you walk, through, or you go through into the garage or across the parking lot for your apartment. Yeah? You drive somewhere, you leave the car, you walk somewhere. Yeah? Unless you go through a, uh, what is called a drive through. Yeah? So you're not really leaving your car when you get your burgers. Yeah? You're leaving your car or go home. So, in terms of space, a um, few more slides. Again, real world helps us to learn. Uh, this is the city of Heidelberg in Germany. 
uh, old medieval town, hills in the back, you can see that. If you Google Heidelberg, you actually will see a re really big castle on top of the hill, uh, river uh, valley, very tight building. Uh, they have a serious flooding issue because they're old town straight at the river. You know? But this is a side alley. This is interesting. They actually put a subway into a side alley. And signage. You know? Therefore, boom, people would find it. You know? uh, serious, you can see the sizing. This is a regular bike. This is, I would give that whole alley 20 feet, maybe 25. You know? Normal, normal sized person, yeah. Um, there are shops all over the place, so part of this uh, pedestrian soul in medieval town or historic, not medieval, historic downtown is walking space. It's like a mall. Yeah? It's called somewhat controlled walking space. If you look up, there are actually apartments and condos and homes in there. The interesting concept what you see here is this is actually a library on the street in the bookshelf. So the, the Citizens Foundation of Heidelberg is basically uh, having a literacy project and they have uh, bookshelves like this all over the place. Burgers and people, Bürgerstift, you know, citizen, Bürger, resident. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you would actually just walk up, take a look at what kind of books are in there, take it, read it, and bring it back, or the other shelf. It's an interesting concept because People are doing this now in the US. Almost like bird houses, so you can put a uh, cover for wind and uh, weather conditions, and then you would do that. You know? So instead of throwing out the old book, you're putting it up on the street, and people, as a some of the public neighborhood library. Yeah? This one is largely organized. To give you an idea again here of walking space, yeah? this is a main traffic route. That was Friday morning, early July. Yeah. So you have the kids doing a trip. You can see this is an organized trip for the kids because they're all had, holding hands on all, all pretty much on a line. The buddy system. Huh? The buddy system. The buddy system, yeah. You see old houses, but you look at they're done, all rehabbed. I think the next corner was the yeah, Starbucks. Nice. Yeah. Uh, you can see there's biking involved. Everyone is basically pretty much walking here because it's a pedestrian zone. Really compact. Yeah? If you look at this, this is not distorted. This is an iPhone picture. Really compact in the, the height and in the street design. As well as compact as how parking is organized in one of the side streets. Yeah? This, is a smart car. this is a smart car. Or, uh, is this the uh, same city? Same city. It's literally it's down, 100 feet down the down this, 100 feet this way. Really, here. Uh, so if you have a full down, size. Down, down here, you turn left, and you'll see that. Can you have a full size car there? Because I see the line, there's kind of like a delineation there. Where? In the parking spot. Right behind the smart car, you see there's a line that runs all the way across. This? Yeah. Oh, well, this is just pattern. This is uh, gutless. This is instead of this for so you can park a full size. No, I think uh, I think this guy is actually illegally parking. But you can see there another car here. So there are some spots here and there. But this is the main purpose of this area is pedestrian. So, no? yes, please. Uh, it's very similar. Uh, one of the cities I uh, lived in in Sweden. Uh, it's, it seems this uh, very old city from the 1200s. Very yeah. compact. Uh, small uh, residential houses like this. So, in terms of smart car, fun story. When smarts came out, they challenged actually parking ordinances. Because you suddenly ended up in one parking spot, one regular size parking spot, having two smart cars parking like this. How do you mirror that? If you have a quarter and drop that in, and you have two smart cars parking there, which one do you give the ticket then? So what was the, the term? term they, changed, they changed the rules. And actually, in, uh, in Berlin, I think now, they actually all had, used to have smart car parking. Uh, like saying, okay, fine, you know what? We can charge you for two cars the same, spot, uh, uh, the same space. We put two cars on it to double the uh, investment. You know? 
So again, different layer. This is the market square. Here up there, you can just literally see the castle. Yeah, this is a panoramic. Uh, hundreds of people sitting out there. It was a cold day uh, in the shade. This is a historic uh, church that has actually a retail around it to give you a context. You can see the church in the backdrop. Yeah, and the other the plaza um, is that this is the backside of the church. So a different concept here again. All over the place you have this headstone uh, cover. There's a small change in the pattern here. This is actually city hall. Uh, there was a wedding that day, and um, very different idea to perceive space. Restaurant sitting outside, yeah? which is not uncommon for us, but this is completely integrated in the urban fabric. Okay? This is not a created space or completely designed. Speaking of designs, remember the courtyard discussion we had last week? The donut building? Yeah, if you have a building like this, a block, and you have passages going into the building, yeah? This is a passage into a courtyard. The only thing you have to criticize if you're in that small, in that small uh, passage or street, this is the only way those signs here was the only way to recognize this and that sign. There was no marketing other than that. No big sign, hey, buy some stuff here. You walk in. And you have the typical beer benches, foldable uh, tables. Yeah, you actually have a small uh, um, shop here, almost like a donut, um, sorry, a hot dog vendor. But then this is actually organized. This is actually a fine restaurant. Yeah, with outdoor seating, you can actually see the bar. And, uh, that. If you look up, what do you see? Garden. Some of window gardens, yeah, balcony, passage oh, here. Chimneys. Yeah. Different different uh, window types we use in the US, but this is residential. This is expensive residential. That city, that downtown core, is one of the highest priced areas in the whole region. 800 square foot, easy $2,000. Yeah. Uh, pretty much no vacancies, but it's still preferred housing also for students. So student housing, rental, shared apartments is flipping over fast because the university is pretty much across the river, that area. But I'm trying to amuse you guys with what are audio visuals. Mm -hmm. This is Community Play 101. Complete streets are streets designed to be safe, comfortable, and physical for pedestrians, cyclists, transit riders, and motorists. And they're designed to be connected to the places people live, work, learn, and play. Design features of complete streets may include sidewalks, multi-use trails, bike or bus lanes, accessible transit stops, median islands, and many others. And each of these helps one or more transportation methods function better without making the others less efficient or uncomfortable. It's not about balancing the use of cars against all other transportation, or just adding lanes for bikes, buses, and pedestrians. It's about travel being more accessible and providing travel options for communities, making them better and healthier places to live. Also, the improved social interaction of complete streets is good for businesses and property values. Even where destinations are close to home, incomplete streets often make them inaccessible by foot, bike, or transit. For example, schools without sidewalks to residential areas make walking less safe for students. And cul-de-sacs create dead ends, cutting places off from people's homes. Routes along high-speed roads without bike lanes, sidewalks, or comfortable transit stops feel unsafe and are used less. Multi-lane roads without adequate crossings act as barriers, limiting access to retail areas and services. By designing complete streets, these negative impacts can be avoided or reversed. Complete streets are also not just city or suburban approaches. They can work in rural areas too, but the design solutions will work different. For example, roads in rural areas may be made complete by providing
providing wide shoulders for cycling and walking, with connections to trails and transit stops. In a village center, a complete street strategy could include marked crossings, sidewalks, curb extensions, and street trees, all designed specifically to fit the character of the small town. So now you know the basics of what complete streets are, their benefits, and the kinds of ways they can be designed. I'm Robert Voigt, and this has been Community Play. I need to sit down with this guy. Those videos are funny. Mm -hmm. um, complete streets, different city again. Yeah, if you, as a saying, if someone travels, you can, he can tell a story. Yeah? So um, this is probably one of the most up-to-date uh, slides I do of pictures of travel because this is the last few months. Um, remember the Malaysia imagery and Singapore pictures? Those are 15, 20 years ago, but it's still valid. Yeah? The story is important. Uh, complete streets, different concept now. Um, this is the high-end retail downtown zone of Mannheim, Germany. We had Mannheim as an example for... All I can think about is the auction. No. City transformation from, let's say, defensive structure to rivers. And they changed this completely into a quadrant-based city grid system and a castle here. That was one of the first discussions we had, transformation of space and how we changed it. Remember? We did, actually, Heidelberg wasn't there too. Mannheim, we did um, my own hometown, I think, as well. Yeah. So this is actually a street picture, a real picture, not Google Street Club. Um, Five to six floors high retail. With this is pretty much all this retail uh, in those alleys. You can see here is a change breaking in the front. It actually, is uh, residential on top of the buildings, uh, mostly um, apartments or apartment style. Um, you can see pedestrian. The attempt of urban green space. Yeah, that's actually streetcar. There's a pedestrian zone with a streetcar running through. Yeah? Um, that's a Saturday morning on a cold summer day. But again, different, different concept, and you can see the overhead uh, power for the streetcar. Everything else is underground, no utilities. Then you turn around while you take the picture, and the streetcar is coming. Yeah? Um, this is distorted a little bit in its width. This looks like a small street. No, it's not. It's, if you look at that, it's actually in the scale of a full, almost a full-blown um, two-lane street, if not three lanes. No, this is not the little street we have here, uh, 30th Street, when you come to the... Uh, about, it's more about the small boulevard you come in between the uh, business school and the parking garage. Yeah? Mm -hmm. A little bit distorted in terms of uh, giving you the dimensions. Yeah? Still, there's a human being for the scale. If you flip that human being, it's multiple, you know, it's 35 to 40 feet wide. Yeah? So, again, different perception of space, different uh, idea of how to integrate walking and lifestyle. You can see people sitting here all over the place, coffee shops and restaurants. Yeah? Imagine Las Polas without traffic and you have two or three tables more on that. People would walk on the street, but not anymore on the sidewalk because the sidewalk would be complete uh, consumed by the restaurants and bars. You should do that as a block party. Is there a block party event like that? Shutting down two or three blocks, just doing that? They just had Christmas on all of it. I am new, I don't know about they that. Do it on, uh, <laughs> yeah. They yeah. do it on South Beach uh, during New Year's. They'll close down Ocean Drive from fifth to 15th to traffic, and it'll all be uh, pedestrian. And then the For New Year's Eve celebrations. New Year's Eve, um, okay. usually when they have the Orange Bowl or the National Championship game, yeah. the Super Bowl, so that's the same thing. But think about it, you would do that every Saturday. That would be nice. At noon, at noon until midnight or something like that. Uh, and create that as a uh, recreational space. Like you take Hollywood Beach around the Margaritaville Hotel, the boardwalk, the beach boardwalk, think about that concept in downtown every Saturday or Sundays. Uh, and say, let's make this a 
traffic or car, carless city. Can you implement that? Probably not so much. It, had, it will take some time. Yeah? But you could argue, okay, fine, it's a way to do this real estate development. Yeah? A little bit more impressions. This is two days walking tour, basically, with an old friend from Cree, at least. Uh, Speyer, we have seen this. This is the old cathedral. This is actually now a shot of that almost a kilometer long, uh, so it's 0.8 miles, 0.7 miles along uh, street. Shopping again, first floor. Some of those shops have the second floor. All the roofs are actually a, um, apartment and really nicely re rehabbed. Yeah? Remember, this, this city is more than 2,000 years old. Yeah? The structure here in the back cathedral is a little bit more than a thousand years, or about a about thousand years now, 950. Yeah. Different scale. Uh, walking down the street, getting closer. This is a Friday late afternoon, five, six o'clock. Yeah. Hmm. Pedestrian zone. I just thought of one, which you should build it on. The second Friday, you can't just, the second Friday of each month. It is in Flagler Village. They have street vendors, like little vendors come out. Yep. And um, you get a free beer, which is nice. And they have the food trucks go there and they shut down it's right downtown Fort Lauderdale. Huh? And it's the second Friday of every month. It's called Food in Motion. Food in Motion. Huh? Yeah. It's very European. In let terms me, of let me be the chest of that. Let's absorb this. Full pedestrian zone. There's no car traffic, nothing, no delivery at this time allowed. Yeah? It's all the place of bikers here, with the bike racks, ding, 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 all the reflections, and people. Yeah? So you really shut down Main Street just for that and have people do it. It goes that far that you actually have a drive through for, bike, uh, for ice. Yeah? Uh, it was interesting to take about the picture I so saw because of the kid, I actually asked. Hey, I'm teaching this stuff. Could I take a picture? This is very humorous that you actually did not dismantle or uh, jump off the bike. You pull in and you're like, yeah, yeah, and then turn the head of the kid. So this is actually staged. This is actually saw it, asked nicely, took the picture. But I think it's a different concept of drive through. Yeah? A little bit humorous. But the idea of all these pictures and this whole video on the complete streets is you can design spaces differently knowing that there are different concepts out there. You don't need to know all these concepts, but knowing that there is something out there you can bring in into your development will help you. you know? This is a little bit much overkill, you know? but this is how urban planners and designers now think of how complete, how complete streets could look like and how you mingle walking as a mode of transportation, biking as a mode of transportation, with the classic stereotype of transportation we have. Huh? What I'm oh, actually here, I almost said that well, mass is actually the transit. Huh? Um, just as inspiration. So then at the end now, we, have, I to, we, have <coughs> we need to actually ask, okay, new renewal, resilience, rebuild. That's how we started the session today. Huh? What I want you guys to remember after this class is that you, whatever you build, there are consequences. Socioeconomic changes and social challenges. Yeah? If you have a business idea of just buying a small apartments and rehab them and put some carpet in it and sell them off, yeah? you make changes. Or you go a different style and you actually build things, you make changes with your company or as part of a company. Yeah? Are you bringing that yet? <laughs> you want to do that now or next week? Utilities. Oh, this is an overview. Ten slides. Ten slides? Uh, that's, that's actually more than ten. Let's, go, let's do this today. We have enough time for today. What are utilities? Water, water. Did I just put that in? Um, um, okay. Water distribution, sewer, electric, gas.
at oil, communications, air, they all have costs and impacts. Did I miss something? Oh, gas, yeah. Uh, did I miss something? I think um, I got it. No? Oh, I think I got it. Yeah. Um, besides the typo. So, they all impact, particularly on the cost. They all impact with direct and indirect cost. You know? um, let's say if your water distribution system is not perfect, there are some nuisances with that. Huh? Unfortunately, there's a city in the US right now which is still troubled with their water distribution and the quality of their water. Huh? Piping system. Again, you put it into the ground, you forget about it. Huh? Wooden pipes is a humorous example. Then Michigan is not humorous anymore. Yeah? Um, what I want to focus on is a little bit water and sewer because we usually don't talk about that and someone always prices that for us in. Yeah? If you do just a development, one building, you might not face it. If you do a whole complete site, you actually have to deal with a little bit more than just uh, a pipe. Yeah? So this is a classic example of how we break the systems of flow down. Uh, how we deal with water, it depends where you're at. Your water sources might be, might be different. You know? we in, the, uh, in Florida, I think we have more surface water and we have some deep uh, aquifers and that's it. There are places in the US that are piping all the water in. Uh, there's such a demand that they actually build uh, canals and even pipelines. There's a pipeline considered, was considered for California because it goes actually east-west, tapping into the water. Not sure if it was built, but there was a concept of tapping into the Mississippi to feed the west coast with water. If you're interested in the environmental issues on these, I recommend some of the readings about Las Vegas, because they are heavily water dependent, you know, because they're in the middle of a desert. And if you look at where they get the water from, this concept is thousands of miles long as part of the delivery system. It's not just the lake next door. You know? So you can already see that the design on main street supply or main supply for this, along the street and then the house branches might also differ because the way how you spread out the water system. So this is the grid system uh, symbolized here. So if you live here, you basically get from two different main pipes water pressure and supply. Yeah? Versus a loop system, and you're sitting here, you get water from this area coming in or from this area. So there are different rules of water pressure and flow in this case. Then. Yeah? Versus the dead end system, imagine you're sitting here and everyone's flushing the toilet during the Super Bowl game in the, in the break. Yeah? Your water pressure goes down. So would you build a commercial building here that depends on water, like a brewery? You are in serious trouble with water flow. Yeah? If this would be your water system for your subdivision, and this is the water main that is attached to the fire hydrants, Depending what's going on in your house burns, water pressure might be a little bit lower here than in terms of flow rate to people. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So same thing about sewer systems. What comes in must go up. Yeah? So don't drop your eyes. Stay, stay strong. It looked like it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Classic approach to sewer systems, and this is really a wrap up. This is not going into the technical details and the engineering like we did have it in the readings. Yeah? Also again, a branch system. You pick up sewage from the houses, go through the branch, or even through the interceptors here, into a treatment plant. Yeah? I ran today, I ran into um, Steve Kramer from Optimization uh, um, Decision Making. They actually went on a 
field trip for waste management, single stream recycling plan. So um, just before class today, what we're going to try to figure out is how to organize actually this class, future class, this class with his class as a field trip. Because my belief is everyone who's dealing with the urban fabric and changing structure in, ur in urban areas needs to be at least once in a lifetime in treatment plan to understand the processes and the needs of that and how to circumvent that. Yes, please. Uh, may not really uh, deal too much, but in Brooklyn, where they have one of the uh, waste treatment facilities, they actually provide free tours to uh, visitors yeah. of the waste treatment. It's really impressive. And the smell fun. is not as impressive, <laughs> but you get over that. Yeah? So, <clears throat> it's very interesting to see what it takes and how what kind of economy or uh, economics is actually on that sector. Nobody really talks about this and what's the environmental impact on your urban development. Yeah? Which was a long term discussion about storm water systems, yeah, because they are pretty much built the same way, but they pick up not at your bathroom, they pick up in front of your house. Yeah? There's a reason why you're not allowed anymore in most European countries, I think all of them, not to, allowed anymore to wash your car on a Saturday morning in your driveway. Because it depends how you wash your car, you would actually cause all the soap and the oil go into the stormwater system. And that's as unfiltered as a runoff straight into your uh, environmental systems again. There is no treatment plant on that. So the reason why this was done or is done in terms of no treatment plan is the old school system had the downspouts from the uh, house and bathrooms from the house, <coughs> you know, storm drain from the street, all combined, you know, now you have the treatment plant here, all combined and if you had too much rain, all this goes up into the river. Therefore, now by code, you actually have two different systems, but still, all of this goes straight up. So, in theory, if your car leaks oil, it's going to be washed out in any of the natural resources you have for water. Now, something to remember next time you see your car tripping oil. Not a nuisance about your car, it's also an environmental impact you cause it. And you can't skip these schematics on, unless you want to know what's the difference between a gravity fed system and force flow. Hmm? Uh, I'm happy to have a problem like that in a apartment right now. On a house? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's a classic gravity fed system. No. Downhill, slow but downhill. What you need to do is you have to maintain flow. No. So that also need to maintain to maintain flow. And the sewer system means you need to have people or any consumers of water up here that actually will flush the toilet, run a shop. No. Versus if you don't have terrain, what you would do is you create terrain and gravity flow underground, you even have a lift station or a pump to make that happen. So that might be your issue in uh, your project, because you have to overcome the slope. Or if it's far out, this is what I've seen uh, in uh, rural areas, is the subdivision actually has a pump station, and they have a four or eight inch pipe they pressurize it and pump all what you consider sewer and uh, water to a distant treatment plant. A small subdivision pumping everything to the, let's say, county treatment plant as a utility agreement. So you don't have to build a septic tank system or your own uh, element, own um, treatment plant. Those are expensive. All right, to sum up. The last few chapters in the book are getting very technical 
with engineering drawings and numbers about utilities. What I try to present here is, besides the walkability part, is in a very short way that you need to observe and learn how to deal with utilities. Because they are huge in cost impact when you develop. Yeah? Simple thing, electric wiring in the building. Ben mentioned a few times now that if you go up a certain height, the requirements for the, your electric wiring, aka utility, is changing in the building. That's a cost factor. So if it doesn't look nice, fine. But at least look, make sure that the numbers are right. Yeah? Once they are in the crown, they are forgotten. Don't forget that. Got to check on this. Yeah? That's a small part then maybe more for the public, for the planning department, public works. But you got to consider that as well when you develop. It makes a good impression on you, for you on the planning department when you come up with these questions in terms of how are we going to deal with utility access? Easements for the companies, easements for the piping and uh, the wiring. Yeah? Uh, last but not least, there is actually Florida Stormwater Association, if you don't know about that yet. Yeah? It's always a good thing to know a little bit who are the players out there. This is a volunteer endorsement, I'm not affiliated with those guys. And lastly, the planning webcast series on YouTube. Uh, this, for next week, I think there was on syllabus a link. Yeah? Those guys are doing a good job to try to educate. And just because we are in real estate development doesn't mean that we should listen to planners. Yeah? We should. Communication, communication, communication. Yeah? Again, if you understand planners, they will understand you. Therefore, the success rate for your project is pretty much high. Yeah? That's part of urban plan as well. All right. Breaking evolutions. <clears throat> when I started today the class, um, we had a short conversation um, how we structure the class today and what's, what's coming for the next assignments. Um, there are two different evaluations in this class. One. Uh, is the course evaluation initiated by the university. This is this, and then the presentation report and peer evaluation is ne next week. What I want to do, I was encouraged, or I, you saw the email last night. Yep. Um, both of them. Huh? Is that both of them? You sent two emails. Both? Yeah, you sent two emails about evaluation. One about peer evaluation? Yeah, all right, both of them. Yeah. See, you're getting confused because I'll send the emails to all the classes. Um, <clears throat> so I had a conversation with my department chair, not Fred Foggy. Thomas Tuchel, Tuchel. Um, because I'm new, how to handle evaluations, how to encourage students to do evaluations. Yeah? Um, I had last year in a class of 22 students and zero evaluations. No feedback from that class besides personal conversation. Yeah. And Nova Southeastern is really strong on they want to know, we want to know how you learn and your learning outcomes and your assessments. Yeah. So I was actually encouraged to give A, some incentives, and B, actually to leave the room for some time to ask you guys to do these evaluations. That's what I put this up, break in evals. So what I'm going to do is I actually want to use class time to give you time to is it is this available or is it opening up tomorrow? No, no, it's, it's available. All right. Well, I want to give I want to give you time if you have a laptop or not, or maybe you can share one uh, or use the computer here in the front to give this evaluation negative and positive feedback. I don't care. I want you to do this. I will come back in about 15 to 20 minutes and we're doing uh, um, urban plan and teamwork. Yeah? This is the very first time I do this in class, but this gives me the opportunity to actually have more than zero responses for that. Yeah? After the break, 
we're going to have a quick conversation about presentation report and peer evaluation. That is the student peer review, where you will review not me in this class, you will review your peer students. And I think I need to say one or two more words about that. Yeah? All right. I will be back in 15, unless you're done earlier. Um, I can't even get into my uh, email right now. Thank you.